Hi, how are you? Nice to see you. Can't come to meet you. They got me already wired. <laughs> hey, how are you? Got a bad back here. I'm sorry. Oh. It's all up there. Uh, I'm fashionable lately to compare you with Franklin Roosevelt as president. Um, uh, this was a man who had some influence on your own life uh, when you were a young yes. man. Can you tell us a little bit about what it is about the way he conducted his presidency that appealed to you then and that perhaps you have tried to emulate in your own presidency? Well, of course, my first vote in 1932 uh, was for him, uh, but I must confess came from a family that had always uh, declared themselves Democrats, so it was kind of natural. But then I think that it was, you'd have to have lived in the Great Depression to understand how different that was than any recession we've ever known since. The Great De Depression was one in which even some of the most prominent business people were declaring that our system had failed, that maybe free enterprise was not the answer and so forth. And there were no prepared programs for, well, like in my own hometown of around 10,000 people. Suddenly 2,000 people in uh, one factory, a cement plant, not a factory, but an industry cement plant, uh, just without any warning whatsoever. One night we're told, don't come to work in the morning, the, the mill is closed. And suddenly 2,000 families, and uh, uh, there they are. And um, there, were, there were just were no provisions as well, for dealing with that. And he came in and from his first words, which I think uh, did so much for the country when in his inaugural address he said the only thing we have to fear is fear itself and you came away feeling yes we are going to do something about this and uh, so there was quite a great leadership but I, I can't answer this just that way without also saying something else uh, my now being a republic does not mean a great change in philosophy most people have forgotten that Franklin Delano Roosevelt ran on a platform of reducing the cost of government by 25 percent, of eliminating useless boards and commissions, and of restoring to states and local communities the autonomy and authority that had been, as he said, unjustly seized by the federal government. Well, today, that would kind of fit our platform, <laughs> not the Democrat platform. But there was something textural, wasn't there, about his leadership that he conveyed to the American people that... Uh... Oh, yes. He, uh, well, you know about the fireside chats. It was radio then, not television. Uh, I guess to this day, he became the most popular program on radio. No other show quite equaled his audience ratings. And he was on frequently. He took his case constantly to the people. Do you think you have the same uh, ability to communicate with people that he does? He did? I wouldn't know how to, how to rate that, and uh, I'd, I'd be embarrassed to, uh, to try. Uh, as I say, the very facts, the figures that show on his, uh, the reception of the people to him on his radio programs. Uh, no, I just, I believe in talking to the people and I believe in, in taking the big issues to the people. I've, uh, I've always believed what Thomas Jefferson said, it's true, that the American people, if they know all the facts, will never make a mistake. The only problem is uh, too often they don't get all the facts. You you have, according to the polls, and you are immensely popular, according to the polls, uh, at an all-time high right now, uh, which indicates that you have a particular affinity with the American people. And you seem to talk about the American people as if you have a special relationship with them. Do you think you have a special relationship? Well, I know one thing. I like them. I like people. Uh, and, uh, and I think they're deserving of that. I, I think the country out there is full of heroes. Uh, a lot of fellows that are just getting up and going to work in the morning and uh, bringing the paycheck home to the kids. Uh, the, maybe it goes back to a small town beginning, 
in which uh, you were known and you were aware of how people rallied around uh, uh, whenever there was a need. And then uh, another plus that I would repeat if I had it to do over again. I went to a quite small college. And uh, in a small college, there's no way you can be anonymous. Uh, the, the college needs everyone's help if they're going to have anything from a glee club to a student body senate to, to athletic teams, whatever. And so many students that had never tried before find that they're literally uh, pulled into extracurricular activities and discover new facets about themselves that they didn't know. And, uh, well, as I say, I, like, I don't think even like is enough of a word. I love people. The polls, again, referring to the, the latest figures, show that uh, between a quarter to a, th uh, excuse me, two-thirds to three-quarters of the people approve of the way you're doing your job. The flip side of that, though, is that somewhere between a third and a quarter of the people don't approve of the job you're yeah. doing, and they seem to be skewed towards the lower socioeconomic group. Does that bother you, and is there a way that you want to redress that? Yes, it does bother me from that standpoint. I recognize that there has to be uh, a number of people who legitimately uh, uh, disagree with my approach to things and would do it another way, but that thing you just mentioned about at the lower end of the scale, I think there is, again, a lack of those facts that Jefferson spoke about. They have been told over and over again with a drumbeat of propaganda that I have, uh, my system and my way of doing things is taking away uh, from the poor the things that they need. And that isn't true. We're spending more today on nutrition than has ever been spent. The, the bulk of the cuts that have been made in any of the so-called social programs were cuts in overhead, in administrative waste and some fraud, uh, the fact that there are people that, uh, that, well, as Milton Friedman described it, he said, if you start paying people to be poor, there are going to be a lot of poor people. But uh, any of these, the farm problem right today, we're spending more than has ever been spent on them. Uh, so I think that there has been this, I see it all the time, these stories, constant references and uh, it's immediately described, well, this problem is due to the fact of the president's budget cuts. I didn't get the budget cuts. What we really tried to do was cut to reduce the rate of increase in spending. But even so, from 1982 to through 86, in domestic spending, the Congress, had they passed the programs that I asked for in 1981, the cumulative def deficit for those few years would be $207 billion less than it is. And the only thing they've been willing to cut is defense spending. And that they've cut $64 billion. But uh, $64 billion and that is offset by a considerable amount that they increased over and above what I think was treating real need. Mr. President, you mentioned a, a minute ago that, that you love people, but love is not always uh, requited. Why do people love you? Why do people look at you and get a certain feeling of confidence or of warmth? Well, I don't know. This is hard for me to answer or talk about. As I said, I came from a small town and a small college, and, and then uh, I certainly have I've never abandoned my roots. I, or shoved them behind me and pretended I came from someplace else. I've, uh, we were poor when I was young, but the difference then was the government didn't keep coming around telling you you were poor, so we weren't. We didn't know that, and you could always find somebody that was worse off than you were. My mother, God rest her soul, was the kindest, uh, God-loving person I have ever known, and my mother was always finding some family or someone that needed help and that we could help, and yet we were poor. Um, 
but that I had to work my way through school and did. And I think back at of all the, uh, uh, instead of boasting about I'm a self-made man, no. When I think back of all the places along the line where somebody stepped out of line and helped, uh, and it has, has always been that way. The kindness of people and the, uh, the people that lent a hand at the time when you needed a, a hand. And uh, they weren't necessarily relatives or very close. Uh, when I got out of school in the depths of the Depression, uh, a successful man uh, gave me some of the best advice I've ever gotten about uh, getting a job. And during that period, uh, the federal government was putting radio commercials on the air, urging people not to leave home looking for a job because there were none. And, uh, I left home looking for a job and taking that man's advice and wound up as a sports announcer in radio. A year ago, sir, uh, it was, uh, a lot of people talked about how long it was going to take before you became a lame duck. Uh, and here we are a year later and you don't hear much talk about lame duckery much anymore with a tax reform bill going through. Uh, how are you doing this? How do you avoid lame duckery? How do you plan to continue to avoid that uh, as you go through your term? Well, I've been there before as a governor, and I found out, and looking back on it too, that my second term there, we got some of the biggest things of all the eight years that I was governor. That I think that there is there's more delay when you start in before you can get into the swing of things and begin to get things accomplished and uh, you just keep going in that second term. California, while I was governor, we put into effect the most comprehensive reform of welfare that I believe has ever been attempted in this country. And we did it all in the second term when I was supposed to be a lame duck. To, to what extent does, has your show business experience help you in communicating with people? And you've got a reputation of being able to read a crowd instantly, to walk into a room and see uh, exactly what... Well, well you, can't, you can't deny that, yes, everybody, uh, whatever a person's profession or trade is, uh, has certain effect on them and certain things that advantages they have in, in certain areas, not in others. And yes, uh, the, very, the very soul of show business is communicating. There's an old rule in, in Hollywood that um, when your face is up there on the screen in a close-up, if you don't believe the line you're say, speaking, the audience will know it and they won't believe it either. And it's been true. And since you mentioned that, and this goes along with the previous question also, speaking of those people that help, in that golden era of Hollywood, there I arrived, under contract to a studio, a sports announcer. And suddenly, wham, I'm shoved into a picture and in the leading role. It wasn't the greatest picture in the world. It was what they called the bees in those days when they, that was the, for the second run on the double feature, you know, but uh, a whole new world. But you'd be surprised with all that people may think about performers. I look back there and the big heart of show business, the stars, the people who'd really made it and were big go out of their, would go out of their way with pointers and to help. Um, and there was a, I remember there was a table in the, in the corner of the commissary. It was kind of a special table. It was known as that corner table because of the little group, Jimmy Cagney and Pat O'Brien and a couple of great directors and people like that that usually had lunch there together. And, I suppose maybe it was because of my background in sports and they were all lovers of sports or something, but the first thing you know, I found myself as a regular <laughs> at that corner table. And, it, uh, they, and then you, when it came your turn, as you progressed, you just had been indoctrinated that you went out of your way to, to help somebody that was new and struggling and just getting a start. 
do you want to be remembered? It's a question you've been asked before, but I'd like to ask it again. Uh, how do you want history to remember Ronald Reagan as president? Well, I, I hope they'll spell my name right. Uh, <laughs> but I've, I've been asked that question a lot, and it's a very difficult question to answer because I haven't given that any thought. I haven't sat here saying I'm aiming at history or anything, but I once answered that question and with regard to what someone had asked about what would I want to see in my tombstone, and I guess I, I'd be satisfied if they just said he did what he said he would. Did what he said he would do. <laughs> uh, a couple of your predecessors uh, didn't particularly take advantage of some of the opportunities that the presidency affords them. I don't, we don't need to name any names. Uh, but uh, uh, what, what is it that, that you've be learned from the last 10 years, say, of uh, the way this office has been conducted that um, allows you to keep your eye on the horizon and see above the, the hubbub, shall we say? Well, maybe some people have become president, and I've never thought of it as that way. Uh, the presidency is an institution over which you are given temporary control or possession. And there are things about the institution that you have no right to, to change. I know some with the utmost of sincerity and have uh, wanted to do away with a perk or playing of the, uh, the uh, hail to the chief or whatever it might be. Uh, I don't think that whoever sits here has a right to do away with those things that belong to the institution. So, so, you want so I'm not going to sell Camp David. <laughs> <laughs> and you would have kept the Sequoia. Uh, yes, even though I prefer horses to boats. <laughs> Can I ask you one question about this campaign you have been conducting in recent months, putting yourself more and more with young people? Uh, there's been a pattern since the middle of May with the Rose Garden ceremony, of course, Glassboro with a high school graduation. Why do you feel this desire? What is it about being with children, not just children, but young adults, uh, answering their questions as opposed to other groups that appeals to you so much? Well, I don't know. You, you know, if you really do like or love people, uh, it's awfully easy to like those young people out there. They're so fresh and eager and so ready to, uh, to go and, and so unspoiled by, by things. It, I do. I, I get a great kick out of that. And I, there are some other things in this job also that, um, along with that, that if you don't ignore them or let anyone else ignore them for you, like keeping them away from you, uh, particular letters, uh, with someone who finally has resorted to writing to you because they think all else has failed. And then to be able to solve their problem and get something done is, uh, is I think, one of the great rewards that this job has to offer. To use the power of the presidency to yes. transcend all this bureaucracy and get through and help someone. Yes. That's, that's something that really yes. appeals to you. How do those letters get through here, though? You, there's a special code, I understand, that gets well, mailed into you. But. Yes, we can do that with people that regularly correspond and so forth. Otherwise, there's about a half a million a month, and there is a department over there. And incidentally, with all the talk of bureaucracy, it is a department that handles the mail, and the bulk of the people doing that work are volunteers who come in as if they were employed and work a full day and every day handling this mail. But the young lady who's in charge, Ann Higgins, she sends me every once in a while a packet that she calls a sample and says I don't have to deal with them, just wants me to see them. And uh, usually I answer most or all of them myself because she has picked out uh, that kind of letter. And, and it's a Only once in my life as an actor did something or almost did something for which I would. It was um, my father 
was an invalid and couldn't work. He died later of the heart condition that he was bothered with. But I knew that he was bothered by having to depend on me. So he and, he and my mother there, and I asked him one day how he'd like to uh, pick up the mail and handle the routine things like that for me and make it a job and get him a secretary's pass at the studio. Well, he jumped at it. And one day he brought me a letter, and it was from a young lady who said she was dying, and all she wanted was a picture of me. I signed. Well, it made me kind of mad the way she went. I said, wait a minute. Somebody that's dying doesn't do something like this. this I just thought, this is a phony. Now, I've never reacted to things like that, except it was just maybe the way the letter was written. And I told my father, I said, oh, you know, that's a phony, and I forget it. And my father persuaded me that, uh, well, just in case. So I did, and I scribed the picture and so forth, and the best regards and all of that, and signed it and sent it. Two weeks later, I received a letter from a nurse in the hospital that told me that the girl who'd written the letter had died holding my picture in her hands, and she wanted me to know how happy I had made her. And if you think I didn't learn a lifetime lesson there, that never again will I feel that impatient or come that close to saying no to, to anyone. But, but that story is, a, is, is an exception to your general perfect intuition about events and people. Well, it was, as I say, whether it was my mood that day or what, I don't recall ever having another situation like it, or whether that the letter, uh, it, it just smacked of, uh, that it was a phony, that someone was uh, inventing a story of uh, at death's door and so forth, uh, thinking that, I guess that's what it, that they would think that they had to do that in order to get a photo. And for heaven's sakes, it was for real. Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, I, know, I know you've read and thought about this, uh, but you've been called an intuitive leader and manager. How much of your success do you think is due to something you were born with, and how much oh, uh, is something that you learned along the way? I think learned along the way, but also it isn't all that just uh, being psychic and getting something out of the air. I have surrounded myself with people that I trust and believe in. When I became governor of California, never in my life had I ever thought or thought that I would serve and want to be in public office. And my first instructions there uh, to the cabinet, to all those others, was that any issue that came up, I did not want to hear the political ramifications. I only wanted to hear, is it good or bad for the people? And I've repeated the same thing here. That all came from when I was president of the Screen Actors Guild, and in a very trying time. And I discovered that many times I could stand up and speak to the assembled actors in a mass meeting and so forth, and, and uh, they'd accept my word and do something. And it bothered me. I thought, you know, how do I know I'm making the right decision that affects the lives of all of these people? And I wasn't sleeping very well. And finally, I just said, what I have to do is, in my mind, look at the entire thing and decide what I honestly feel is the best for them. If I make a mistake, it's a mistake, but do that. So I took that into the governor's office, and I've taken it into, the, into this one. And this is what we do. I hear every side, and all this rumors and talk about friction in the uh, executive branch, no. That's exactly what I've asked for. I want to hear that person that disagrees with this or that. And finally, uh, it's like a board of directors meeting, except we don't take a vote. When it's over, and sometimes not then, I come in here, and then on the basis of all I've heard. And if I haven't heard enough, I go back and say, we'll discuss it some more. And then I, I make the decision based on what I believe is honestly, morally right for the, for the people. Mm -hmm. President, thank you very much. Uh, you've, you and I can get up easily. We can. Yeah. <laughs> you've.
You, you have me, you have me feeling I've done crooked or something. <laughs>